Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future. Adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents... X minus one... Tonight, gray flannel armor. But first, hear this. Everyone knows about and admires Bob Hope's frequent globetrotting trips to entertain our servicemen in far-flung corners of the earth. But have you ever wondered what it would be like to actually travel halfway around the world with one of America's greatest comedians, accompanied by an all-star troupe of entertainers? Well, this past Christmas, Bob Hope and company set out on a 12-day tour of the Far East. Entertaining servicemen in Honolulu, Okinawa, Korea, and Japan. And NBC's monitor went along, with microphones open all the way. This weekend, you'll find yourself a voyager on this exciting trip, along with Bob, Jane Mansfield, Hedda Hopper, and Jerry Colonna, as monitor broadcasts highlights from Operation Entertainment. And this is only part of the top variety of information and entertainment monitor brings you all weekend long, beginning Friday night. So start your weekend right with Monitor on Friday night and stay with Monitor all weekend long for celebrities, music, news, and sports over most of these same NBC radio stations. Now, X-1 and Part 1 of Gray Flannel Armor. My name is Thomas Hanley, and my case history is of particular interest to anthropologists, sociologists, and students of the bazaar. In its humble way, it serves as an example of one of the more obscure mating customs of the late 20th century. To begin with, I own several gray flannel suits and many slim neckties with regimental stripes. Millions of us roam the streets of our great cities, Footsteps firm and hurried, eyes front, voices lowered, dressed to the point of invisibility. But inside, inside, I fairly seethed with romantic ideas of swinging cutlasses, of beautiful damsels, their hair shimmering in the moonlight. In short, let's face it, I was a romanticist. But romance is a commodity difficult to come by in the great cities. Life is too impersonal, too busy, too standardized. This particular Friday night, I returned from my office to my one-room apartment and prepared to face another long, dull weekend. Then the doorbell rang. Good evening, Mr. Handy. Uh, if you're collecting for something, come back after payday. My friend, I'm Joe Morris, a representative of the New York Romance Service. Main offices in the Empire State Building and branches in all five boroughs, Westchester and New Jersey. Uh, you must have the wrong party. Oh, no, Mr. Handy. We're out to serve lonely people. And that means you. Don't deny it now. Why else would you be sitting home on a Friday night? Well, the fact is... You're lonely. And it's our business and our pleasure to serve you. Serve me with what? A bright, sensitive, good-looking fellow like yourself needs girls. Girls? Nice girls. Now, these young ladies I was referring to, Mr. Hanley, are not uh, uh, professionals. They are sweet, normal, romantically inclined young ladies. But they are lonely. There are many lonely girls in our city, Mr. Hanley. Oh, yes, yes, I suppose there are. Funny, you, uh, you never think of it that way. I mean, um... 
if you're not a girl. True, true. Now, the purpose of the New York Romance Service is to bring young people together under suitable circumstances. Oh, oh, I see. A kind of, uh, <laughs> you'll pardon the expression, a kind of friendship club? I should say not. We at the New York Romance have done what should have been done years ago. We've applied scientific precision and technological know-how to a thorough study of the factors essential to a successful meeting between the sexes. Factors? What factors? The most vital ones, my friend, are spontaneity and a sense of fatedness. Oh, well, spontaneity and fate are contradictory terms. Certainly. Romance, by its very nature, must be composed of contradictory elements. We have graphs to prove it. Are you saying that you sell romance? The very article. The pure and pristine substance itself. Mind you, I didn't say love. I didn't say common animal passion. I said romance. The missing ingredient, Mr. Handley, in modern society. The spice of life. The vision of all the ages. That is what we sell. Uh, very interesting. If I'm ever in the market, I'll get in touch with oh, you. No, just a minute, sir. Try our system for a few days absolutely free of charge. Here. Put this in your lapel. Oh? Well, what... Well, what is this thing? It looks like a small transistor radio with a tiny video eye. As it happens, it is a small transistor radio with a tiny video eye. Oh? What does it do? You'll see. Just give it a try. Remember, romances sponsored by our firm are fated, spontaneous, aesthetically satisfying, and morally justifiable. Well, uh, all right, Mr. Morris, I'll accept the free trial offer. Uh, wear this in my lapel, you say? In the lapel. Uh -huh. Oh, all right. There it is. Happy romance, Mr. Handy. Listening to the Gray Flannel Armor, tonight's attraction on X minus one. Are you able to brush your own teeth? Not everyone can. Not a man whose arms have been crippled by polio. There are thousands of disabled polio survivors who must depend on someone else to help them perform the simplest, most personal acts. With your help, many polio victims can learn how to be independent. Right now, there are 100,000 survivors of crippling polio who need help. They need your dimes and dollars to pay for expensive care and equipment. Your contributions will provide trained hands to teach a polio survivor how to live with his disability. Thanks to you, a polio-scarred life will once again seem worth living. Remember, your generosity is the one hope of thousands for whom sock vaccine came too late. Join the 1958 March of Dimes. Won't you right now send your dimes and dollars to your local March of Dimes headquarters? Now X-1 brings you Act Two of Gray Flannel Armor. After Joe Morris left me, I took off my gray flannel jacket and examined the small device attached to my lapel. It had no knobs or controls. It didn't seem to do anything at all. I shrugged, put my jacket on again, tightened the Windsor knot in my tie, and went for a walk. It was a clear, cool night. Like most nights in my life, it was a perfect time for romance. Around me lay the city, infinite in its possibilities and rich in its promise. But it was devoid of fulfillment. Nothing ever happened. I passed lighted apartment buildings and thought of the women behind the high blank windows, looking down and seeing a lonely walker on the dark streets. Wondering about me, maybe, as I was wondering about them. Nice to be on the roof of a building. Look down on the city. Huh? Huh? Who said that? I, I wonder... Oh, sure. <laughs> this transistor thing. Hey, uh, what was that you said about a roof? Oh, I guess it isn't two ways. Oh, it's not a bad idea, though. Would be kind of pleasant to look down on the city lights. No. 
Not that one. Well, what's wrong? Oh, oh, sure. Wrong building. Uh, you mean this one over here? Oh, no answer again. Well, it must be the right one this time. At least I hope so. I walked into the lobby, and I remember thinking how you had to hand it to New York romances. They seemed to know what they were doing. I took the self-service elevator to the top floor. From there, I walked up a flight of stairs to the roof. Oh, well, the air smells good up here, at least. No, not that side. The west side. Okay. I hope you know what you're doing. I certainly don't. <laughs> this turns out to be some sort of joke. I'll... Oh. Hello. Oh, I'm, uh, I'm sorry. I, <laughs> I didn't mean to intrude. You're not intruding? Well, I, I didn't see you at first there in the shadows. I know. The light. Mention the light. Uh, oh, um, uh, those, those lights. The lights of the city down there. They're beautiful. Yes, like a great carpet of stars. Or, or spear points in the gloom. Like sentinels keeping eternal vigil in the night. Like sentinels keeping eternal vigil in the night. Take her in your arms. Take her... What? Uh, <laughs> nothing. Nothing, a mistake. Uh, come here to me. Yes. Yes. <laughs> As she was melting in my arms, I caught sight of the small transistor set pinned to her shoulder strap, the one exactly like the one in my lapel. You can't help feeling a little odd about a romantic meeting set up and sponsored by transistor radios. I could visualize a million young men in gray flannel suits roaming the streets in response to barely heard commands from a million tiny radios. I tried to forget my doubts. The next night, I took another walk and found myself in a slum section of the city. I decided I'd made a mistake and started to turn around. Why not walk on? Hmm? You want me to walk down this alley? Oh, well. Help! Help! Oh, oh good night. Uh, two muggers after a girl. I'd, uh, I'd better look for a policeman. Why do that? You can handle them. No, no, no. A policeman can do it a lot better. No, you must. Now. But, 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 but there's two men. They're probably armed. You can do it. Then, oh, oh, well, here goes. Oh, you know. Now, wait a minute. Let me go. Oh, let, wait, oh, I'll, let I'll, me I'll go. save you. Let go of her, you rat. Oh, oh, there. Take that. And that. Ah, that'll teach you to harm a helpless girl. Oh. You, you saved me. You saved my life. I had to come. I... Had to come. Yes, I know. Take her in your arms. Yes, I know. I swept her into my arms and we embraced there in the darkened alleyway. As I held her close, my cheek brushed a shining jewel in her raven black hair. I had to look twice to recognize it, but sure enough, it was a tiny transistor receiver just like mine. I was suddenly angry. Oh, the girl was lovely. There was no denying that. And the circumstances were undeniably romantic until you realized that it was all a kind of cheap play. Fated and spontaneous. That was a joke. Angrily, I tore the transistor from my lapel and threw it into the nearest garbage can. I stalked away into the night, hardly realizing where I was going. I didn't really wake up until I reached the waterfront. I stood there, looking at the oily black water, and let the brackish-scented breeze fan my face. And then, unexpectedly, I was aware of another person nearby. The moon slid from behind a cloud, and her auburn-tinted hair caught its light and held it for a moment. 
She turned her face toward me with frank curiosity. At this time, there was no transistor radio to throw me a cue. I didn't need one. It's a nice night. Maybe. Maybe not. Uh, The beauty is there, if you care to see it. What a strange thing to say. Is it? Is it really so strange? Is it strange that I'm here at this very moment? And that you are here, too? Perhaps not. No, perhaps not. Uh, Let me look at you. Oh, you're really beautiful, you know. Am I? You know you are. Oh. Oh. You're... You're lovely. Do you really like me? Like you. If I could only tell you... Oh, I'm so glad. You see, I'm your free introductory romance, given you as a sample by Greater Romance Industries. What? With home offices in Newark, New Jersey. You see, only our firm offers romances which are truly spontaneous and faded. Spontaneous and faded? Due to our technological researches, we are able to dispense with such clumsy apparatus as transistor radios and... Sir, where are you going? I was sick and disgusted. After that, there were several other attempts to get in touch with me, but I ignored them. I wanted no more to do with the romance game. In a couple of days, I called up a twittering aunt of mine, and she arranged a blind date for me with the daughter of one of her oldest friends. The blind date was a nice, friendly girl with plain, mousy brown hair. We were introduced in my aunt's living room, and we sat out on her sun porch and talked. So you're Tom Hanley. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, yes, I am. Your aunt has told me a lot about you. You work in advertising, don't you? Yes, yes, that's right. Um, uh, Madison Avenue. Oh, I think that's thrilling. Advertising, I mean. It's such an, an interesting field. Well, uh, we, uh, we like to think so. <laughs> yes, I imagine you do all right. Uh, seems like, uh, it's warmer this evening, doesn't it? Oh, yes, it is. Although I don't mind the cooler weather so much. Lots of people complain about it, but I don't mind. Well, I, I don't either, I guess. As long as you're dressed for it. <laughs> yes, I suppose that's the secret. Oh, I was just thinking, uh, do you like bowling? Oh, I don't know. I, I've never bowled. Oh. Do you like tennis? I'm crazy about tennis. Well, tennis is all right. Yeah, I guess you could say tennis is fine. I'm crazy about it. Well, all right. So it wasn't romantic. At least it wasn't at first. But there must have been something about it. We began to hit it off, and we had more dates, and one thing led to another, and the first thing you know, (laughs) darned if we didn't get married. (laughs) Yes, that's the story of my courtship. Of course, it isn't the whole story. At least, if you're making a case history, you have to know the important things, and to my mind, one of the most important of all happened after we were married. We bought a nice little house out near my aunt's and settled down in it. Then, one Saturday morning... I was out cutting the lawn. Hi there. Huh? Uh, did you, did you say something? I said hi. Don't you remember me? Joe Morris. Oh, oh, sure. New York romances. Well, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Morris, but you better take me off the list. I'm, uh, I'm married now. Certainly. I know all about it. Congratulations. Oh, thanks. I mean, I know all about the way it happened. Introduced by your aunt. Talking on the sun porch. Corny, old-fashioned stuff. And now, uh, don't get me wrong. I'm not knocking it. Quite the contrary. Do you know what we down at New York Romances call this? No, what? Hanley's Mode. We studied you. A lot of commercial possibilities there. We've got it down on graphs. 
effects of embarrassment on the psyche, the role of the ant in American courtship, the whole work. What are you talking about? New York romances, what else? We've got a new service. It's called the Old Fashioned Plan. The what? We provide bonded ants for young men to call up. We even have the ant walk into the sun parlor at unexpected intervals with a plate of cookies or something. They say the suspense becomes almost overpowering. Like our motto always said, spontaneity and a sense of fatedness. It never misses, my boy. Never misses. You have just heard X-1 presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features The Repairman by Harry Harrison. Being an interstellar troubleshooter wouldn't be so bad if only you could shoot the trouble. Galaxy Magazine on your newsstand today. X-1 has brought you Gray Flannel Armor, a story from the pages of Galaxy written by Finn O'Donovan and adapted for radio by William Welch. Featured in our cast were William Redfield as Thomas Hanley and Guy Rep as Joe Morris. Others in our cast were Abby Lewis, Pat Hosley, Hetty Galen, Freddie Chandler, and Helen Gerald. This is Fred Collins speaking. This broadcast concludes this series of X-1. We sincerely hope you enjoyed it. X-1 was directed by George Boutsas and is an NBC Radio Network production. Guest star Don Amici is your host on Nightline, your line to new worlds of entertainment after dark. Tonight on most of these NBC stations.